Well, when we see members of our armed forces today, we know that they're all well-trained professionals. But years ago, there were some full-time fighters, but most rank and file were men who left their fields to be called to fight for a particular cause. Their survival depended on their ability to handle weapons of the day. For those of you who visited the Heritage Centre and seen some of the weaponry on display, now will be the opportunity for you to see it in action. So please welcome with the commentator, members of the Wars of the Roses Federation. Well, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to the firepower through the ages at Bosworth Battlefield. I need to warn you, you need to open your mouth slightly and cup your hands over your ears. This is going to be loud. Well, hands over your ears. <laughs> and there you heard the mighty pole guns going off, the cannon going off. I don't believe I heard the great eight barrel Rebaldequin going off that time. And now the archers, the mainstay of the English army at this time. They are shooting just to get their iron at the moment. They're shooting towards the flags to get their range. You can see the flights of the arrows. You can see how far it can go. This isn't at full draw. They're lofting the arrows a little high so it'll drop down. The range they could actually go is a lot more than this because contrary to popular belief, the actual average uh, draw weight of an English longbow was approximately 120 pounds, and that is quite a lot. On the Mary Rose, apparently some were found 180 pound draw weight. If you've ever tried to shoot a bow before, it would probably have been about 60 pound draw weight. That's a modern bow. So you're thinking of something three times that strong. The men, though, the men and boys, would have been practicing this since they were seven years old. It was compulsory to actually shoot at the butts. The guns are now loaded, and the gunners are signaling that fact to the master gunner. They're um, raising their matches to say, we're loaded, we're ready. The guns are active. Ah, we are doing, we'll do not a rolling volley, a very slow rolling volley. We're starting with this amazing eight barrel piece here called the Rebaldequin. It's a wonderful name. This was probably used at the Battle of Cressy and it has eight gun, eight gun barrels, each, each an inch bore and it's the closest thing to automatic fire that the high medieval period had. Listen out, this is going to be loud. Round of applause for the Rebaldequin I feel. That is a beautiful, beautiful weapon and devastating. <laughs> and it takes a very long time to load. They reckon they can get probably four or five shots off in an hour. The barrels get very, very hot as well, which slows things down somewhat. And the gunner there is giggling. No shooting. We now have Juliana, who is a large muzzle loader, I've just been reliably informed. This means the powder and the ball goes down. <laughs> goes down the loud end of the gun, not the breech end. That was my Lady Juliana. <laughs> Following that bre breech loader, we have a breech loader name of Rose. Go on, Rosie. <laughs> Lovely. Not quite as loud as Lady Juliana, but not bad at all. They're now going to do a second shot to prove how fast they can reload rows. Lovely. Uh, being that she's a breech loader, they can get the canisters in and out very, very quickly. You heard them all. No. A smaller, nameless breech loader this time. Oh, Vanessa, I do apologise. Vanessa. Oh, lovely. Do try not to breathe the smoke in, it has a somewhat laxative effect, or so I'm led to believe, by the gunners. <laughs> They're known for being a regular crew. And that, I believe, was my lady Vanessa having a second shot. That was Gwenefer clearing her throat. <laughs> yes, a, a subdued little gun there, a Sunday gun, I feel, that one. Now we have the Tannenbergs and the pole guns. 
precursors of the modern musket, modern rifle. We now got hook guns or hack butts. Same that comes from the same uh, Dutch word. And these were come like a halfway house between a cannon and a handgun. They're stood on a stand. Uh, they need that for the weight of them. They've got greater penetrative force than a regular handgun has. But they're a lot uh, narrower bore than the cannon. And I believe that may have been... The hackle bus is going off, thank you Master Gunner, very much. The hackle bus is going off there. These are very portable guns that the men could take on the field with them and they could run around and take out, they could actually snipe with those. Not particularly accurate, because rifling wasn't invented for a long time yet. However, they were still quite lethal if they actually hit somebody. They could go through three or four men standing one behind the other, and modern tests have proven this. They're, they're shooting either, um, the, the larger cannon is shooting stone ball, or they're shooting sacks filled with lead shot or with chain. If you imagine that flying through the air at you, it'll go through your horse, it'll go through you, go through your friend as well. Evil, evil things. The smaller guns will be shooting uh, lead ball. Now the archers are now going to collect their arrows. And I believe, because they're about to uh, engage in some archery, some competitive archery, I believe they may be going to perform what's known as the archer's prayer. No. I did actually find the name Mum, you did. Keep forgetting your name. Shut up, Charles. I found it. You know what, mate? You think he's going to be loud? Master Archer, archers. are you ready? There you go, watching archers. I don't think the guns are going off yet. On your marks, get set, go! <laughs> Look at the arrows. <laughs> Gentlemen yeah. on the Rivalda Quinn just claimed four. He's absolutely right, but it is cheating. Well, gentlemen archers, if any of you got more than 12 arrows off, raise your bow. Good and high so we can see it. Anyone got more than 13? More than 14? More than 15? 16? 17? 18? 19? 20? 21? 21? 22? 37. Do we think he's telling the truth? Uh-uh. We think you lie to them at 21. 21 as a reliable as a reliable count for today. We've beaten yesterday by one. Gentlemen on the guns. Do we have any count apart from the four from the Rebelda Quinn? Six again. We had six. So we got six. Five, four from the Rebaldequin, and yeah, he thought he could, he could have given us eight, but he thought he wouldn't show off now. And we had three of the handgunners who got three shots off each in the minute. So you can see the guns, a great deal slower than the archers, but obviously greater killing power, penetrative power. You'll... The archers, now the guns are made safe, and now going to scamper down the field. It's a scurry of archers to go and collect their arrows. 
You'll notice there's a body of armed men, or two bodies, I believe, of armed men at the far end of the field, looking somewhat nervous. There's very good reason for this. So John, will you see that missed pass, ladies and gentlemen? Do you care? Jill Ladder, do you care? So, the missed pass between Sir John Babington and Sir James to Kingsley will take place now before we change ends. Sir James is ready, Sir John is coming on to point. Spur on! Sir John just getting his horse off late. A missed pass. Gentlemen, if you will hold at the end you're at and rerun that pass. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, one of the knights indicated that he felt the pass was not equal and raised his lance in his chivalry. Sir John reacted. Can we give them a cheer for chivalrous behaviour? Yay! So the two knights will go to the ends they're at and run from that when they're ready. Spur on! Oh yes. They're into the list, the lances are down. I think a touch for Sir John, I'm not sure. A moment's bated breath, well my marshals tell me. And of course they will. Sir John touched to the arm. A miss. A miss for Sir James. Sir John touched or not? Sir John touches to the arm, so one point to Sir John. But it is what we call an attempt, so there will be no point for breakage, will there? Indeed, indeed, ladies and gentlemen. So, just the point for the arm. Sir John will not be happy. Now, ladies and gentlemen, to make even scores, two of our knights will now swap ends. Sir Harry. Baston and Sir James will swap ends. Sir Harry has anticipated our instruction, clever lad, and Sir James complies with all due speed. So the next run will be against Sir Mark Capel, the Midlander, and Sir James de Kingsley of the South. Hardly partisan, are you? So, ladies and gentlemen, Sir Mark's visor is down, he has his lance. Sir James is lance, uh, uh, there, visor is down, he has his lance. They indicate ready, Spawn! Laissez aller, they're into the list. Oh, a shower of broken wood, ladies and gentlemen. Can we have a huzzah? Huzzah! That was fine breakage on, oh, oh no, it's a sweep. A sweep from Sir Mark. We have a, a small, gentle boo for the Midland. Boo! And an O from the Midland. And we would see where Sir James struck. A good hit to the head. Three points for Sir James to Kingsley! Sir James gets the breakage for the headshot. Give him a huzzah! So, ladies and gentlemen, one more pass from these two. It's going very well at the moment. So, ladies and gentlemen, the two knights arming. Sir James is armed and his visor is down. Sir Mark's visor is down. He turns on, spur on! They're into this. Look at that speed, ladies and gentlemen. And it's all gone pear shaped. <laughs> a good break from Sir James there. Sadly, Sir Mark appeared to have been having issues. I will defer to the King as to whether he wants to see that run again. The King agrees with me that since Sir Mark raised his lance, indicating his unreadiness to clash. Sir James's forceful hit does not count. Can we have an R for Sir James? Oh. Gentlemen, we will run that pass again. It is a no pass. Imagine if this were scripted, ladies and gentlemen. How would I make that happen?
still trying to get the stick. Uh, the squire has just come and told me that Sir Mark has wind problems. <laughs> and he raised his lance in reply to them. I think what she actually meant is the crosswind, which you can all feel and see on the flags, lifted his lance, making an attempt to commit to a clash unsafe for the horse. So can we have a cheer for Sir Mark there, saving horses any damage? Yay! We love our beasts most dearly, and I commend him on his actions. So we'll run that pass again. When Sir Mark finally makes it back down the list, it's in his own time. Perhaps the wind is holding him back. Apparently there are tablets you can get. <laughs> Somebody behind me is obviously a student of medieval cooking and suggests that Sir Mark needs to lay off the pottage. <laughs> so, Sir James is ready. And holding. Sir Mark issues for his lance. They're ready. Spur on! They're into the list. The lances are down. And it's a break for Sir James. Give him a huzzah! Yeah. Obviously, that change of horse boding very well. So, that was the first pass, was it not? So, they've still got two passes, as I said. Youth and impetuousness personified in young Harry Paston versus the redoubtable veteran that is Sir John Barrington. See how he waits impassively and implacably. He's ready for Harry. Harry's thinking about it. Spur on! They're into the list. The lances are down. Oh! There was a slight clash there. And a taint. Harry Paston is said to have attainted by my marshals. Sir John did not break, did he not, Marshal? Can we have a decision, please? The crowd are waiting, and so am I. Sir John. An attaint. Now, ladies and gentlemen, an attaint is where the lance has touched, and you saw that puff as the lance broke, but not broken fully. So I leave it to His Majesty the King. Does the boy get a point for an attaint? One point only to Harry Paston. Was there a break from Sir John? No, Sir John did not break. Sir John was the armor tank. I'm sorry, I am confused. Now the king. Yes. The king rules that Sir John did not break. I'm not arguing because I like my own castle. We believe that there's a second pass coming up. And it's a good break. Can we have a huzzah? Who on the sides? They say Ale, they're into the list. The lances are down. And it's a double break. Can we have a huzzah? Yeah. Sir Richard, the, the King Richard, sorry. King Richard breaks for three points to the Taj. Sir John breaks to the, to the body or the head, sir? To the head for three points. Now, I'm in a most difficult position, ladies and gentlemen, because traditionally, up until this point, the King has scored the breakage. I have a modest estate I would like to keep hold of. So I will now score the breakage. And thankfully, the King has the breakage. Oh, relief. So that's four points to the King. Three to Sir James after one pass. A small wardrobe malfunction for the King. The uh, large blanket that's falling off is known as a comparison, ladies and gentlemen. It can either be an incredibly rich fabric showing how much money you've got in the case of the king, or it can reflect your um, coat of arms in the case of somebody like Samar. So we'll just allow that adjustment to be made. We have two more passes in this blazing sunny afternoon. And then I can go and sit down somewhere quiet and recover. Are you excited, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah. Really, really, really excited! Yeah. Who wants?
wants to see King Richard break another lance? No. Who wants to see good Sir James break another lance? Yes. Who doesn't care as long as they hit each other? Yay! <laughs> so the king is ready. Sir James' his visor is down and locked. He has his lance. They're ready, turning in, spur on! Let's say, Ale, the lances are down! It's a double break, let's have a huzzah! Huzzah! So, the king has struck to the Taj for three points. Sir James breaks to the arm for one. So, we will look for the breakage. Oops, there goes my man. Um, could we hold the lances up, that the public may help me? Um, that one's close. Um, we're going with the king! <laughs> For safety's sake, so the extra point goes to his majesty! Ladies and gentlemen, in the confusion, I know not who is to win. Do you have any idea? I might be lying. They spur on! They're into the list, the lances are down! It's a break for Sir James, but not for the king! So instantly... So instantly Sir James gets one point. Where did Sir James hit? To the Taj for four points. <laughs> How does this lie, my dear? <laughs> Visor is down and he's armed. Sir James' his visor is down, he's armed. Let's say they're into the list. This will decide it. Oh, well, that's pretty decisive, isn't it, ladies and gentlemen? And the king broke to the Taj. He gets the breakage for four points. Sir James blissfully missed, perhaps enjoying a quiet country life and having a head. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, winning by a clear four points, his most noble, his most regal majesty, King Richard III of York. A York, a York, a Tudor, a Tudor. Anybody from Lancaster? No, no mind. So, ladies and gentlemen, I give you our champion, his most noble majesty, but I would like you to thank my goodly squires, my ladies that count, my marshals, and the most important people in this arena, apart from the king and me, our horses. So three cheers for the horses. Hip, hip. Hooray. Hip, hip. Hooray. Hip, hip. Hooray. So, ladies and gentlemen, I would la like the king to lead our... Oh. Ladies and gentlemen from the arena, I would thank you for watching our joust and embracing the lack of script. It has been a fine afternoon. I've enjoyed it. I hope you've enjoyed it. Join us on the battlefield in a little time to see the fate unfold of our most noble, soon-to-be-dead Majesty Richard. I humbly commend myself, Sir Rupert Hamilton, to you, and I thank you. You've been great. Give yourselves a cheer! Right.
Well now ladies and gentlemen, the sights and sounds of battle are in the air. For safety reasons, we'd ask everyone to stay well behind the outer arena ropes. A reminder too, there may be sudden and extremely loud noises during the performance, which you may find distressing. Uh, they are replica weaponry, it's as authentic as possible, uh, and it may be that you need to cover your ears or just open your mouth to assist with any pressure if you feel any pain. Now this is always a very special occasion of the battlefield because it's here in these Leicestershire fields around us that nearly 528 years ago the last major battle of the Wars of the Roses was fought. Now to help us appreciate how the battle unfolded and to bring back to life a day which changed the course of our history. We welcome our commentator, my Lord Stanley, and members of the Wars of the Fet Roses Federation. Let's give them a good welcome. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I would ask you to listen to me, to cast your minds back to the 22nd of August, 1485. Tudor, my stepson, has brought his troops from France and picked up levies from Wales and at this moment marches towards us on this very field. But overnight, King Richard, good King Richard, who we all love, do we not? Has spent the wee hours in a church praying mightily for he is troubled by visions of doom. Can we have an R for the poor King? But he brings his forces onto the field. Shall we hear a York, a York? Now I too have troops to commit to this battle, but to be honest, I'm not sure who to work with. The king, of course, is the king and holds my son, who threatened his life, but I do have other sons. But of course, the, uh, my good wife's son, Henry, is at the head of the other army, so I'm really in two minds. So I'll talk you through what happens and we'll make a decision somewhere near the end of the battle for the Stanley troops. But first of all, ladies and gentlemen, the forces of York spill onto the field here. They shine in the sun, full of martial prowess. And as they do so, I ask you to marvel. The men, the weapons, the sense of tension in the air. And I can see the redoubtable archers making their way onto the field. Once they are all arrayed, I will ask you in just a moment to consider a more somber moment. I will wait for the commanders to indicate readiness. And I ask you to contemplate those who will die and have died on this field. Well, now is the time when we remember that in war not everyone will be able to leave the battlefield to go home to their loved ones. So before the battle, may I ask you all to join in one minute's silence to remember not only King Richard, but all those who fought here and gave their lives to a cause they believed in at the Battle of Bosworth Field.
Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> as the sulfurous fumes of the cannon waft across the field, I will describe to you the disposition of our noble lord, the king's army. To the far side, away from me, because I'm the important person here, we have the forces of my lord Norfolk in red, a doughty gentleman who is fully in the confidence of the, of the king. In the middle, the king's own battle is arrayed in the colours of blue and murray. But behind me, behind the barn, are the forces of Northumberland, my Lord Percy, who dallies, perhaps fearing to die, as all of his family have died in the past. He seems unwilling to commit to the battle. Marching towards us in the middle of the field, ladies and gentlemen, are a fine bodily of men. They are the Stanleys! A Stanley of Stanley! It's not my fault. It's difficult to pick a side, you know. Ah, uh, my brave captain meets the vintner in charge of our good King Richard's forces. What Richard doesn't know is we've decided we're not quite ready to come on yet. So the heralds discuss, my Lord Howard becomes involved, as he often does. Seems to be a small amount of disagreement. The, the Herald is giving a message. It's probably about the demise in, impending of my son. But it's a truly difficult position to be in, ladies and gentlemen. As I said on one side, our noble liege, King Richard, enters the field, a powerful man, a good king, a just king, and I'm sure nobody here believes the scurrilous rumours about the princes in the tower, do you? Richard wouldn't have had them done away, would he? No! Somebody was bound to find out. <laughs> he comes to meet my goodly Stanley retainers, with my brother. They spot pleasantries. As the king requests that he bring his forces level with the king's own, and my brother has decided that perhaps we should wait in better cover until a decisive moment when the Stanley forces can commit and make all of the difference for the battle. For the king, of course. The king says, I would much prefer if you would array with my troops. And, and my brother there says, Nay, my lord, we feel that a midpoint in the battlefield will enable us to strike at your foe at a decisive moment. Does anybody believe that at all? No. No, no, no. I thought it was a bit of a thin lie, actually. <laughs> so, the troops of the Stanley household <laughs> repair to a prepared position neither here nor there. The king turns to rouse my Lord Howard's troops and his own battle. They shout, a York, a York! A York, a York! A Stanley, a Stanley. Well done, boys. So. The king exhorts his men that it is a just battle they fight. A noble battle, for he is the true anointed crown king. Is he not, ladies and gentlemen? Yay! And Judah, albeit a relative to me, of course, is merely a usurper who has come from France via Wales. Yay. Who is for Judah? Yay. Most of you are for York, I assume. <laughs> I'll bear that in mind later on. <laughs> Where's your car, Paul? <laughs> and the Yorkist troops of my lord of Norfolk and of the king's own retinue are fired and shout a York, a York! But we hear nothing. Northumberland and Percy are quiet behind the barn. Can we have an ooh of disappointment, ladies and gentlemen? It seems that Percy will not show his face yet. At least my troops are on the field. So, ladies and gentlemen, the king repairs to behind his troops. His two main battles. Blocks of troops are drawn up. Men at arms and billmen, armed with poleaxe and bill and spear. They are ready for what Tudor has to bring of them. And speaking of Tudor's forces, they begin to enter the field, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, yes. 
the shining armoured forms of my Lord de Vere of Oxford comes onto the field wearing their brown stripes. Oh. Yes, if you're going to boo, ladies and gentlemen, let's be loud about it. <laughs> my Lord of Oxford! <laughs> No Trainer! comments about the colour on the uniform, please. <laughs> Followed by them, in blue and white, the main forces of the Woodvilles and of my Lord Tudor himself. It is a reasonable force, but if my Lord of Northumberland were to commit, and I were to commit, they would be outmatched by some thousand. But at the moment, with both Northumberland and my own forces uncommitted, it is an even match. It will be a battle of attrition, ladies and gentlemen. There will be many casualties. So, my Lord Oxford brings his troops across in front of my Lord Norfolk. And Tudor matches his forces against those of the royal household themselves in the blue and Murray. Oxford engages Howard! A cheer for Howard's men! A second column is formed of Tudor's forces and they head for the Royal Bodyguard. Cannons roar across the field. In fact, so many cannon balls made of stone were found on the site that we now know there was a significant artillery duel. So there is truly a fog of war, the smell of sulphur, the scream of men as stone cannonballs rip them limb from limb. The wail as bill and sword seek unprotected flesh. This will not be a quick battle, ladies and gentlemen. It will be a war of attrition. You can see the struggle between the two battles. The artillery duel spread smoke and death across the field. The archers let loose across the field. Let's try that again. The archers let loose across the field. There it is. Raining death upon their opponents. Possibly the unwary commentator if he's not lucky. <laughs> the press seems not to be going too well for Tudor and Oxford. The royal battle and those of Norfolk begin to lap round them and push them back. <laughs> Tudor's small force already begins to be whittled down. I'm not sure, ladies and gentlemen. Should I commit for the king? It's not conclusive yet, although Tudor is having a hard time of it. What do you think, boys? Should we commit yet? No, no, my brother thinks not. We shall hold fast. The arms of the Yorkist force now begin to flank the Tudor and Oxford forces. They retire in good order. The archers seek a new and safer position. Single combats break on the edge of the combat. The two forces break as more cannonry fires down the field. So, ladies and gentlemen, a lull occurs in the battle. The forces of York have lost but a few men, but have made a decisive and early strike on Tudor. Oxford and Tudor look tired. Many of their men have fallen. But as yet, there is no clear victory. Can we have an ooh of anticipation, ladies and gentlemen? The king does not have a clear victory yet, and Tudor is not yet beaten. My Lord Howard, impetuous as always, last to leave the throne. But I can see, ladies and gentlemen, that the Stanleys are on the move. They assess the situation as wedges go forth from the Tudor and Oxford lines in to the Royal Bodyguard. You can see them smashing through. They're trying to break through, but as yet, Percy has not committed his forces. Northumberland dallies by the farm. 
Richard could desperately do with his support. The precipitate attack by Tudor is causing damage to the royal bodyguard. They are winnowing away Richard's precious across the ranks. Once more, the battlefield is obscured totally by smoke. Men drop to the floor wounded. It looks as though the desperately needed force from behind the barn, from my Lord of Northumberland, is not coming to Richard's aid. Now the forces seem more evenly matched. The damage done by the early assaults by Tudor and the Oxfords have winnowed away much needed resources from the Yorkist battles. The Tudors are now supported by elements of my brother's forces. The Stanleys have committed to Tudor! Because quite frankly, looking at it from my point of view, I don't think Northumberland's coming to play. Therefore, Richard is out banned! No longer king, because we know he's a usurper and a child murderer! But Tudor! The true Lancastrians! <laughs> so you can see my Lord Norfolk's attempt to beat back the Oxfords has failed. He has taken many casualties and limps back to his starting position. Likewise, the centre block, the royal block, retires to lick its wounds. More arrows fall upon them from the Welsh longbowmen. Replies of cannon stall the advance of the Tudors, but do not stop it. Ouch. You can hear the Yorkists shouting, Retray! Retray! Retire in good order! Things are not going well for them. However, Tudors' block has taken some damage and they too retire. It's a standoff, ladies and gentlemen. The timely intervention of Stanley forces has stopped Tudor being beaten, but the battle is not yet won. My judgment as a man who often spends time upon fences is that this may well end up being attritional to the extreme. I feel that perhaps neither army can engineer a clear, momentous victory. So things will crash on and on to the bitter end, much like the terrible battle at Towton. Mm. Norfolk is undaunted, undaunted, ladies and gentlemen, he leads his men to the attack again. A foolish but brave young man. Howard is into the fray once more. Yet again his forces engage Oxford. Oxford stretching his line out in an attempt to thin out the numerical advantage that Howard still has. You can see on the edges the swordsmen and the pole axemen lashing away at each other while the billmen stab and poke away seeking exposed flesh. The royal battle readies itself to commit against Tudor's forces. The Welsh levies and the French mercenaries may not hold against this steady assault. They strike down, they reap the front rank of the Yorkists as they meet them. Limbs are hewed, heads are split. It is a foul and dirty business, this war. Once more, the Yorkists seek to flank the Tudor troops. Once more, the gunners sneak up on me when I'm not expecting it. <laughs> I can see certain elements of the Tudor battle retreating. Perhaps they feel they have been mauled badly. Howard and Oxford are locked in a death embrace, ladies and gentlemen. The two loathe each other mightily, and they continue to struggle. Richard watches impassively.